gonna shift gears, we're gonna move into the modern period, and we're not gonna quite stick with landscape painting, strictly speaking, although uh, uh, culture, it, we're gonna see culture is writing, is painting, is poetry, so in a sense they're synonymous, uh, even if it's not landscape. So uh, just bringing this slide back, I'm not gonna stick with this. So what happens to the landscape painting tradition in China as we move later? It's a history of continuous change. It's quite dynamic change, although there are periods of the doldrums. Um, but one of the things is this generational transmission. So, so what I was trying to get at is, okay, uh, painting is a cultural practice. The cultural practice is the creation of novelty through mastery of an inherited world of, shall we say, patterns. But patterns, in a sense, are like uh, forms of best practices. I mean, the analogy that I sometimes use in classes is also farming which is, I think, interesting in our history classes. They say, well, Chinese painting is a little bit like farming, okay? Well, what, what's interesting is if you use that analogy, then you're forced not to use the language of a representational discourse, you know, like it's an image of. This was like farming and producing crops. What is it an image of? Or what are you trying to say with your core? <laughs> um, but instead, it's productivity. And it's basically farming as inheriting best practices. And we're talking about old-fashioned farming. Uh, where, you know, who would you, where would you learn your farming from? I mean, you grew up in a farm, and you kind of know this is what you do at a certain time, and this is how you do it. But then <coughs> the climate changes, and so you have to adopt. You sort of learn practices, you learn patterns. But those patterns are not written in stone as commandments, so that you have to, we have to, we have to plant corn now. Well, wait a minute, no, we have to plant it now, because that's when you plant it. It doesn't work that way. You're not going to be a successful uh, producer of bounty if you do that as a farmer. So basically, it's taking a mastery of kind of a tradition, you might say, inherited practices, but then those practices are <coughs> the control by which you can, the disposition by which you can dynamically respond to changing conditions and ongoing conditions. And then it becomes a kind of interdependent interaction with nature. This is this from this yin and yang point of view, this kind of, um, quite literally in a sense, seed, fruit, seed, flower you know, kind of relationship. But it's between the farmer and the world of nature. And the farmer in this kind of responses to nature. Nature responds in kind to what the farmer does, for good or ill. And if the two conditions are such and the farmer and nature work well together, uh, then you <coughs> bounty. And so in a sense, what farming is, is producing bounty, which produces life. But then farmer is successful in producing bounty, shows nature Nature is revealed through the successful farmer as life, producing bounty, fertility, and so on and so forth. And I say that's kind of how that may be helpful in understanding the cultural tradition of calligraphy and Chinese painting. This is what we're going to do. You have these, these patterns of practice that you've inherited, that you've mastered, but they're, in a sense, as prescriptive and sacrosanct as they can become. They're not really strict rules. In a sense, practices that the sages somehow charismatic, they realize in their creative transactions with the natural world and with other human beings. Um, the rhythms that, oh, one, one thing I should mention is that in the, in the pedagogy of painting, and I had this personal experience and when I was studying in Taiwan and I was interested in calligraphy. Um, and I had, I had two teachers, one teacher uh, with two other students. He uh, would teach by not explaining anything. He just basically took the brush, for our first meeting, take, we got newsprint. He takes the brush, and we have the, and we ground our ink, and he puts the brush in your hand, forms your fingers around the handle, then he holds onto my hand, and he dips the tip of the brush in, and then we go to the newsprint, and then we do this horizontal brush joke, and we do it several times. And then he lets go and watches me, and he grabs my hand again, and then he lets go and he watches me, and he grabs my hand, and then he leaves me alone and goes to the other two students, and goes back to me, and keeps grabbing my hand. And we do that over and over and over and over again. Next class, we're doing the same thing over and over again. You know, it takes a while before you can get beyond that one trope. You know, and he'll just, the only thing he would say to me is like, because I was kind of timid, so more strength, more strength, use more force. But he didn't explain anything. We didn't look at diagrams or no DVDs. He didn't demonstrate either. He just held our hands. And let, so, so if you're thinking about this painting tradition as social, a social performance and culture and generational, uh, Move, moving from one generation to the other, generational cycles. That was kind of like, later on it dawned on me, whoa, 
<laughs> if I had stuck with it, you know, and become a serious calligrapher, I mean, sort of like at that point when I'm in my 20s, deciding to become a master violinist. That's the kind of work it was. Like, no, that's not going to happen. <laughs> uh, and I couldn't see dabbling in calligraphy. I don't know. So uh, it, was, it seemed like such a serious enterprise. But had I stuck with it and became good, or reasonably good, you never say you're good. Um, every time I wrote something, he'd be there. His rhythm is part of my rhythm. Am I him? No. I'm both him. And so, so it's this, what we were talking about this morning is that I'm already hybrid with a whole world of people. And then he becomes one of them. And not only is his rhythm part of my physical rhythm in the movement of the brush, but his teachers are also. And his teacher's teachers are also. And that's not just his teachers. It's their experience of their families who made, helped make them those teachers. They become part of me. And then here I'd be in the United States, you know, if I were teaching calligraphy, all of that would be there too. It's, you know, this kind of extraordinary thing about the ecotone that Peter was talking about. This is an, could be an, potentially an extraordinary kind of thing for culture to be that way. So what happens in the Chinese tradition, we're starting with just taking the leap, moving into the 14th century, is this generational uh, cycle, these generational cycles of, you know, and it becomes conscious. And, and interestingly enough, it becomes a self-aware conscious aesthetic enterprise looking to the past because the Mongols have invaded and they've taken over. And so the question arises is where does China reside? Mm -hmm. China resides in those people for whom when, it's their when is their culture, it's their right, that's what China is. Maybe ge geographically, politically, uh, we are ex in exile, but we still have the cultural practices and that's where China, and China lives in us. Right? And those of us, the elite literati who practice it, that's where it lives and we preserve it. So, uh, Needs On, this is a, a canonical masterpiece by a famous 14th century painter, although this is painted after the Mongols are gone, but um, 1372, he dies in 1374, but he's part of the, the elite literati tradition under the Mongol occupation. And um, one of the things that, uh, there's this, in this, exploration of the really powerfully effective best practice sacrosanct cultural patterns in landscape painting. He's one of the seminal figures in purifying in a sense, or finding that what's essential in this, the, these cultural forms in landscape painting, and he boils it down to this kind of thing. You've got a few trees, some rocks, empty pavilion, no people, water, distant mountains, and a composition that's laid out tending to be vertically, with empty space here. So trees, some rocks, pavilion, water, mountains, that's it. And, and then he does this over and over and over and over again. And become, he becomes uh, a model for the next generation of painters. And so he, he establishes through his sort of response to the tradition, he's looking consciously to the tradition of painting. And I'll show you what that might have looked like. And uh, calligraphy, poetry. And so he becomes this kind of paragon of these cultural practices. And then as a result, he's also creative in his interaction with the, with the, the previous, uh, with the past. And so he says something new, and this, this is, people catch on. And, then, and that becomes very powerful and becomes a model so that others start to emulate him. So this is what, kind of what this is going to be about. Now, in the painting here, we see a number of seals. Guess who put the largest seal that's there? <laughs> the Chenlong Emperor in the 18th century. And it's not just one of his seals, there are a couple of other seals. This inscription, though, is added by the artist a couple of years after the painting was done. So the painting dates to 1372. The, the inscription added by the artist is added in 1374. And, <clears throat> excuse me, it's interesting what the painting's about. It's basically, somebody seems to somebody's doing a little regifting. One of the things <laughs> that I point out to my students is that the context for this work is not museums or galleries. We don't have museums or galleries in China until we get to modernization. Right, so, so this is, remember, it's about community. It's a very small elite <coughs> community, and it's for themselves. These, these are gift exchanges. Uh, there's kind of a gift economy, uh, some um, anthropologists have noted in this. But basically, this is an example of a painting. You're not painting it to exhibit it. It's a painting as a gift, and he gave it to somebody who seems old Bi Xian, who brings it back and says, oh, he wants me to add an inscription to it, because he's going to give it to a doctor. Mm -hmm. And the doctor happens to live in you know, my ancestral home. So, the you know, aspiration is. Um, the Rongxi studio, sort of the kind of like studio of this uh, doctor's estate, is where Dr. Renjun lives peacefully. Someday soon I'll return to my hometown and come to a studio, we'll hold cups of wine and hang up this picture. 
May Ren Zhong live long so that we can carry out this intention of mine. Now, what is this painting about? I think it's a birthday gift. I mean, not in, in a sense coming, it's an age gift, right? So Dr. Ren Zhong is wishing him long life. He's turned some important age. And so his friend Bi Xian is going to give him this gift. Uh, Ni Zhang maybe knows him, but he's actually has a favor to Bi Xian. If nothing else, he's going to um, inscribe it for him, and they're going to, it's going to be a present. Uh, maybe he's turned, you know, 70, or, or maybe he's so lucky to be 80, I don't know. Uh, so landscape paintings, <coughs> particularly, uh, not necessarily clearly this one, uh, but particularly uh, landscapes with large pine trees in the lower part of the painting were often uh, suggestions of longevity and thus served as gifts for people turning a uh, certain age, it's like 70, 80, and so on, so well, 60, 70, 80. Anyway, so that's part of the social uh, phenomenon of these paintings. And so there, okay, so this becomes this icon of 14th century paintings, and it's beautifully painted. Uh, it's ink on paper, uh, very, you know, it's contemplative in its qualities. I happen to have the good fortune of seeing it um, in person in Chicago for a long period of time, and uh, a special exhibition. And when you look at the paper, you have the sense that if you blew too hard, the ink would all fly away. Mm -hmm. You're just sitting on the surface. Uh, so this slide just is a little too harsh. Um, there's the pavilion, the trees down below. Now, past reference, the shapes of the rocks and the shapes of these rocks kind of is, is basically, we don't have paintings from this period, it's the 8th century, mm -hmm. Tang Dynasty China. We don't really have paintings that can compare. This is actually a detail of a tomb mural. Uh, but there's something about the structuring of these rocks, the shapes, the handling of line work that suggests the connection with Nizan. And we do know that Nizan is looking to Tang Dynasty as the, in a sense, from their point, that time, his time and point of view, looking to the Tang is kind of like the, the seminal age where you have the poetry, painting, calligraphy connection. Mm -hmm. um, so it became a model. So they're looking to the past for a model. Well, you know, where is the Chinese, where is China in its cultural traditions? Well, it seems to be a seminal moment. So it becomes a model for uh, painting as well as calligraphy. So here's a, what I showed you as a detail of this of the polo players, I think. Uh, dating to the early 700s. Now here's a, a, a rock, old tree, and bamboo painting, standard subject matter for the literary elites in poetry, but also in painting. All kinds of associations, longevity, perseverance, endurance, etc., etc. all sorts of human values in the subject matter. But when we look at the structure of the rock, in the close-up detail, it's absolutely gorgeous painting. Um, here, if you look at something like this, within the context, maybe it doesn't strike you, but if you know a lot of, uh, of the history of Chinese painting, you say, oh, this, this can, there's a connection, there could be a connection here. And it makes sense, given what Ni Zan is saying, that he's, he's working in the genealogy that connects him to the Tang Dynasty and to the 8th century. Now, Ni Zan is following a certain model. This is um, a, an attribution to a 10th century painter. It's likely 14th century, not 10th century. But it's showing what is thought to have been, we have titles and such, possibly a 10th century standard composition. In addition to the kind of compositions I showed you in the first talk, it's this one. It's a variation on the landscape painting tradition where you give prominence to the pine trees, and then you pull them to the side, and you get this distant view. Um, and so Ni Zan's composition is, in a sense, a variation already on a 10th century composition that was fairly, very likely fairly standard and common. So he's looking at 10th century paintings. He's also looking at 8th century work. Mm -hmm. right. Now this, this is an 11th century, and possibly 10th or 11th century tradition on the right. If we look at this detail here, we have this little bit of a visual trope. The tree's pulling to the side, and then you have this expansive view. So this, there are other moments, if we wanted to de analyze them, we find the Goshi's early spring paintings that are like that. It's like, almost like a pastiche of uh, various sorts of motifs. 8th century example, this is actually a painting on um, a pipa um, that was given to the 8th century Japanese, <coughs> in the Japanese collection. But the idea of the valleys, the trees pulling to the side so that you could get a view into a distant valley uh, seems to be a motif in 8th century paintings. Here's another example. Here with, now the trees are sort of more in the middle, and then we have the empty expanse that's river uh, in the wintry landscape and the distant mountains. And this is a variation of that. Um, here's another version of it. 
I'm sorry, a 1990s version of it, by the way. No doubt. In the PRC, you know, he would, yeah. yeah, Chairman Mao with the Buddhist halo. <laughs> um, very likely, Neo Da Hung did not see the original painting. It's in Taiwan. It's going to in the early 1990s. Um, more Shangmao trees at the side. So Nizans is a variation of this composition, uh, but you see it over and over again in variations. Um, the Ming Dynasty version of it, which Ming Dynasty, the, the painters get a little bit more adventurous. There it is, but instead of having the open view, he sticks another 10th century landscape motif, the waterfall in the distance, and he puts it there. So they're playing around again with these motifs and with these patterns. This is actually an extraordinarily beautiful painting from the 5A. I know the brushwork, it's so dynamic and so skilled. I mean, they call themselves sometimes amateurs. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I had to show you some details of it. Look at the roots. Our mm -hmm. students used to call this flat. I don't know. I don't think it's flat. Anyway, ah, now, this is Shenzhou. 15th century, uh, walking with a staff. There's the man walking with a staff. Some think this is meant to be kind of a poetic self portrait of the painter Shenzhou. Um, and Blingo, it's his version of Mizon. 15th century, 1370s, you know, maybe we don't have an exact date for it, late 1400s. Um, the trees here are sort of like Mizon's trees. Um, we have the expanse of water behind them, that's this. And then if you look at the dotting here, the dotting is very similar to Mizon's. The mountain shapes are different. It's actually using, following a different 14th century tradition in this having the rock forms. Ah, 18th century. Um, but this one is, the title of the painting is called Landscape in the Style of Nizan in the 18th century. Uh, the Nizan disappeared too fast. Mm -hmm. Sorry, let me come back there. <laughs> and Wang Yanqi did a lot of these paintings. And so it gets to the point in 18th century, see, landscape in, the, in, landscape, landscape in Dong Ji Chang's <laughs> version of Huang Gong Wang. And that means that's the title of the painting. So um, there's a reaction against this. Uh, eventually, but we won't, kind of, we won't talk about that. So now, landscape, writing. Writing is landscape painting. Eventually, landscape painters, already starting in the 11th century and 12th century, not the, the so-called literary elite painters, or poets who are also government officials, uh, begin to actually sign works that they do, that they do playfully, they say they're doing playfully. Instead of saying painted by, they say written by. Right. This is how, so close for them in their advocacy that painting is calligraphy. That they say, I, this is written by, it's a written landscape. So, so in a sense, that's my justification for saying, look at some, uh, some work that deals with calligraphy, but it's, it's still nature. And indeed, actually, calligraphy, and it's apart from the content of the writing, it's, it's understood deep in Chinese traditions, that the brush strokes that make the, China, the characters for China, the Chinese writing system, are in fact nature. Right? So every time you wrote, and you, particularly if you did calligraphy, you were writing nature. Uh, beyond the content, but actually in the forms and the rhythms of those forms that you were practicing. So um, this is a contemporary Chinese artist, Zhang Huan, um, quite, was quite active internationally in, in in the late 1990s and early 2000s, here it is in New York in 2000, and he's been uh, since back in China working and quite successful. Um, he gets funded for some major projects. There's a huge project he did, public work in San Francisco, that was gargantuan, of, uh, made out of basically it was the images of the limbs of Buddha statue, but just the limbs, and then uh, multiple head and multiple arm part made out of copper, uh, but of an enormous size that filled the plaza in San Francisco. So he, he was quite successful internationally and successful in China. This is a piece from 2000. It's actually a series of photographs where um, he hired three calligraphers, not just anybody to go write, three calligraphers uh, to come uh, to his studio in the morning and they stayed for 12 hours and they wrote on his face and he told them what to write. Um, and what starts out, one of the names here, this is actually the name of a famous tale of a foolish old man who, to, who tries to move a mountain. 
was actually a tale that Mao Zedong liked. Yes, yeah. right, right, right. So they they live near this mountain. He wants to move the mountain, and so they, his whole family's out there. The sons are out there, and they're digging and whacking away at the mountain, and all the local villagers saying, "You're stupid. You're crazy. Why don't you just move? You're never going to move that mountain." And his retort was, "Hey, it might take us many generations, but we will move this mountain." Mm -hmm. You can see why Mao liked this story. The gods supposedly took were were, were impressed, and they moved the mountain for him. But, um, so that's what this is. Other parts, um, he says, are like names of parts for face reading, right? for fortune telling, divination, face reading. So one of the things he says about all of his work is that he considers the human body a language. And I find that really interesting. So, so in a sense, this is his idea that his face in this series of photographs, to make the point that this is a language, what's written, particularly the divinatory parts, is written is my destiny. It's written as my my not not quite fate. It's it's the con the disposition of my future, the disposition of my present present who I am even karmically. I'm using a Buddhist term. This is how it goes, right? And they keep writing. And he says to do calligraphy as if you're doing a serious piece of calligraphy. No slap. Till the point where his whole face is completely covered. And what I find interesting is the different sorts of uh, interpretations of the piece. Like when you go to the West. The Western sort of contemporary art criticism is this is kind of like a, a contemporary critique of the authority of writing that overwrites and erases personality and individuality. And it's not exactly how he was thinking of it, but it's read that way. For him, this is the whole idea of I'm, I, I, my body, through my body, I write myself into existence. And that is ambiguous because there's a bad part of that. You know, because of the, 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 the sort of the authoritative traditions that are there, but there's also the positive aspect of it, right? And go either way. Um, but it was kind of a performance, um, uh, an exploration of this kind of of his understanding his body as writing. And for me, this resonated with past uh, Chinese figure painting in landscapes and whatnot. Is that the Chinese figure painters, or this is actually a large landscape painting, it's about ten feet high. Um, is not interested so much in, in rendering or describing human phys physiognomy or what people's faces look like. That comes later with the advent of Western um, ideas. But rather, uh, the way I put it is, is you, you look at clothing, you look at uh, the drapery folds, you look at the demeanor, the deportment of the body, how it stands. And what they do is that seems to be more important. The body, in its physiology, is a social thing. It's social acting. It's social gesturing. It's how you stand. It's a response to in the culture in which you grew up, the family you grew up in. And how you stand may also be a response to whom you're meeting with, whom you're interacting with, how you gesture. So the body is, first and foremost, a, a way of speaking. It's a social language. And it's interesting talking to people who sort of know something about Chinese medicine and have researched it. And they think, then they've got me thinking about, well, the, the human heart pumping blood is actually, first and foremost, a social activity. And then the social activity transforms the human heart and how it pumps blood and gives shape to it, not the other way around. Uh, so, and then it becomes a circle. But uh, what happens, though, is, again, remember patterns, is that, that the, the body as social gesture gets boiled down to two main patterns. One is the really formal, well brought up, poetic, literary, elite gentleman, and two friends greeting each other. The other one is the Taoist sort of eccentric recluse hermit type. Mm -hmm. And this is just a pose. It becomes a standard pose. So they, so they take the body as fundamentally social, focus on that, and then it boils down to two basic patterns that I see in the history of Chinese figural art uh, that then get varied over the course of generations. Uh, so, yeah, this is a noble scholar. We don't know who did it. We don't know the context. This is an 18th century inscription. See them in the will tree. You don't even have an exact date. But, you know, here, here's me writing my dissertation. Right? So, um, and, and, of course, you can guess what this is. It's something to drink. Um, and the expression of his face in the detail is like his cross eyes a little bit. And it's hot and all that sort of thing. But this pose is important, right? <laughs> right? This says something, right? The resonance of the charisma of the hermit recluse and then ends up being these later images of the Buddhist images in China of the Bodhisattva Guan Yin. Right, so it's, a, it's actually a mixture here of, of the, the Indian uh, pose of royal ease that comes through in China, plus this Chinese notion of uh, depictions of Taoist hermit recluses and eccentrics. Um, <coughs> 
So this brings me to Xu Bing, I think one of the most interesting, um, creative, and thoughtful contemporary Chinese artists. He was an um, experimental artist in the late 1980s, um, and then ends up in the United States in around about 1990. Um, stays based in New York for quite a number of years, and uh, he left China because in the late 80s, call you know the, the the political atmosphere wasn't good for people who are doing certain visual arts experimental work, mm -hmm. and uh, so uh, one government critic actually took a number of these experimental and experimental artists to task for the kind of work that they were doing, and so he left. Um, he was in the, invited to do a residency at the University of Wisconsin Madison and then he stayed in the United States, but worked internationally. Interesting how things have changed. A couple of years ago, he was invited by the government in China to serve as the vice president for the Central Academy of Fine Arts in Beijing, the most prestigious art school in China. And that's where he is now. Um, so, look at those glasses. Um, born in 1955. Ah, wordscapes. This is actually a, uh, my slide of an exhibition called Wordplay that I saw in Washington, D.C. at the Sackler Museum. This was about 1990, maybe just after the mid-1990s or something like that, I don't remember exactly. But what he does, and this is actually a project where he was out in Tibet and in Nepal and whatnot. He and another artist were doing some, some money and able to do projects. And then when you zoom in, you look at these landscapes, and he would do his sketches. He had done the exhibition where there was this landscape sketch notebooks, and he sketched this way, too. But what is he sketching? These are Chinese characters. So, you know, this is, and, and many of them are sort of earlier forms of Chinese characters. And so instead of painting trees, he paints certain kinds of trees. He actually writes the character for trees. So it's this play on the pictographic character of Chinese, but also the history of the development of the Chinese writing system, but also the elite literary notion that writing is painting and landscape painting is writing. So he's literally, in a sense, playfully writing these landscapes. So he calls them wordscapes. He does this also in a three-dimensional way, where in, at the uh, sample, he was, I think it's a 2001 book, the sense of time is all skewed. Um, he, he, he was asked to pick a painting. So he picked this landscape painting. I'm sorry, it doesn't show very well. And then he incorporated, he extended it from the wall three-dimensionally into the space of the gallery um, with his writing for written forms. And so let's get closer up here. He uses these forms. These are ancient. Some of these are ancient forms, and they're a mixture. They're not all consistent from the same period. So earlier seal scripts, and there's Bronze Age writing, sometimes Han Dynasty clerical script. Um, and so he, these are the glossary of the, of the forms that he's using. And then he makes them into colored plastic. And so what these are here, outside of this landscape, here we have clouds. And then we have rock, sure, sure, sure. and then we have grass, it's hollow, and then we have water in all these forms in different colors coming out into the space. Here's rock, here's the Dao, path. <laughs> mountain, small mountain. You want bigger size, bigger mountain. Right, so. In the actual character. Yes, the actual character. So this is the Chinese character, shirt for rocks. This is a really form for shot mountains. You and clouds, <laughs> you know. I, when I saw this, this yeah, there's just shui, water. You know, feng shui, shui. <laughs> so I thought, wow, this guy's got something going. Um, and great fun, too. I mean, people love this exhibition, by the way. Yu fish. And the path. Dao, 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 dao. You take the path up to the painting. <laughs> Along the grasses. So here's some of, the, some of these forms. Um, the project that I'm going to sort of talk about now briefly, actually, you guys might have seen it. I mean, you go to this exhibition from the Museum of Fine Arts a few years ago. Yeah. Uh, fresh ink, where a number of Chinese artists were asked to pick something in the museum and then do something about it, and be inspired by it and do something. And Xu Bing was one of those, and what he decided to do is found editions of the Mustard Seed Garden Manual for Painting. Um, and here he is, it's a photograph that I pulled from the catalog of him looking through a rather beautiful color woodblock print edition of the Mustard Seed Garden Manual for Painting, and I'll explain a little bit about what that is. The Jianzi Yuan Hua drawn. This is the title page for an edition of this Mustard Seed Garden and the painting, which was published um, during these years. But the first part of it was published in 1679, and then we finished the last parts of it that were to end up being published in 1701. So it's just quite late. And what it is, is a model book for painters. So all those patterns, 
And here was a model book that was designed to expand the number of people who could painting. So it, it actually has wood, it's all woodblock printed, woodblock printed images of this is how Guo Xi painted mountains, this is how Fan Quan painted mountains, and, and it has little text explaining and identifying and how they did a glyph, or how this is Nizan, these are Nizan trees, these are Guo Xi's trees, and then various figural types that show up in landscape painting, various sorts of uh, flora and fauna in the shop, all identified, labeled, brief explanations, and then this was disseminated so that, you know, if you were, you know, you wanted to be part of the, the culture, the when, you could actually do this by copying. And the basic way was you had these books, model books, and you would copy. What was necessary, though, ultimately, as a teacher, how do you put all of these forms together to make something that actually works, rather than just arbitrarily stitching them together? So he, he was inspired by this. In fact, uh, Xu Bing's training as an artist was in print reading, printmaking. Um, he grew up with books. His father was a victim of struggles during the Cultural Revolution. And he was sent down uh, to work in the countryside, too. And when the countryside, one of the things he did is he, another artist, actually produced woodblock printed books. And they would actually do New Year's good luck uh, calligraphy for the local people and that sort of thing. If he's one of those, at least as he says, he probably would have written a positive story about his experiences during the Cultural Revolution. He was younger too. Yeah, he was younger and also his experience was such that he learned something. He helped him learn something from, from that experience. This is um, an open page of the Mustard Seed Garden Manual and to give you an idea what it looks like um, with a little bit of a caption and here's some explanatory text. Um, here's another, another page showing different types of uh, this gate, the top of a gate structure combined with thatched roof cottages. There's another kind of gate structure, different sorts of roof types, um, different sorts of figures. I like this one. <laughs> you know, uh, and uh, different sorts of landscape settings, all kind of taken out of uh, paintings and then, and then collected here. Grasses. Uh, here's a, here's a close-up view of one of the beautiful uh, woodblock, color woodblock print editions that Xu Bing is studying. Uh, but he actually picked, he picked this one because of the clarity of the line for his project rather than the color one. And so what he did, what he does is he um, made digital copies onto transparencies of selected images from this manual. <coughs> he pasted them onto paper to make, oh, how long is this thing? I can't remember how long it is. Um, maybe the length of this table, I think, is this, 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 this landscape. He's going to make a landscape scroll. So he's pasting them onto paper. Here's the end work. You see all these pieces that are cut out, and he's putting them together. He's assembling these patterns into a scroll. And he then transfers them. He carves out. He does all work himself into wood blocks. Um, here's some of the, the images. And then he made his own. What I think is interesting, from what I can tell, because I haven't seen the exhibition, this is the title page, and it's the, uh, the Landscape Scroll of Mustard Seed Garden, is what he calls it. Uh, it is calligraphy. This is the opening, but it reads from left to right. It reads from left to right. So he's, he's already kind of like doing something. He says, this is not your traditional hand scroll. It's going the wrong direction. And then he, it's a pastiche, it's a complete pastiche. Mm -hmm. And it shows up, the more you look at it, you realize some things don't fit together. Mm -hmm. um, here we have these grasses, and then suddenly there's this over here, it scales off. Uh, and then here are these both, and he leaves the text in. Mm -hmm. And look at the size of this fisherman, with the sailboats that are over here, and then this fisherman over here. He playfully assembled these things to create his own landscape based upon these sacrosanct patterns using this manual. So, so in a sense, shooting is really understands this, the, how the, what I've been talking about, how this tradition works in the transmission of gener generation to generation. He plays with it. Yeah, but all these patterns, but what's missing is, one of the important things that's missing is he's not fitting everything together properly. And what, how would you learn how to do that if you were really serious about it? You need a teacher. And that's because there's, the, there's this un the ambiguity of, yes, you can do all these and you copy them, but how do you speak them? You need a teacher. You need somebody who can help you 
uh, assemble the brush strokes into a, a character and assemble the characters into a beautiful piece of calligraphy in the future. He just does this on his own, but he's always conscious that he's playing around with. If you look at these clusters of trees, let's zoom in. It says here, needs on, needs on trees, and right next to them are Washi's trees. <laughs> so, so if anyone who knows the history is thinking like, what's well, this needs on? How does that work? Um, and then um, here's something we're even more close up needs on. So, so, oh, oh, that's why. And there, the very guy who sticks in here. <laughs> <laughs> and then he says, uh, the method of painting a great waterfall, a large waterfall. Uh, but then this part of it doesn't belong completely. So it's, it's moving around certain amounts of text. And then this is one of the most technique that's instantly recognized by people who know Chinese landscape history. Mi Fu, uh, his dot technique from the 11th century, but no Mi Fu actually exists anymore. But, uh, so this would be how Mi Fu made his mind, because he puts that there right next to the wrong association. So some of them are wrong traditions, but long couldn't be put together uh, quite deliberately. Um, he was a gate there, a town <laughs> with a gate. Uh, so this is what this is from the uh, Lester Sea Garden manual itself. So we just simply lifted that out and invited it in here. Doing this in kind of a vermilion red, which also isn't right. You know, it's just actually associated with seals, the color of seal, <coughs> uh, for one thing. And then, then these beautiful birds, waterfowl, and uh, where are they from? Here. So. What I was getting at in my first talk is about you know the, all these patterns, and then you get to the point in the tradition where oh, you just simply catalog them all and distribute them to everybody, and everybody can start to practice and learn uh, landscape painting. In fact, this is much, very much a contemporary phenomenon. If you go to a, a bookstore in China, you, know, you go to the art section and you're interested in doing calligraphy, or you're interested in learning how to do landscape painting, all sorts of manuals, mm -hmm. and they're basically copy books. Um, you, know, you practice this model of calligraphy, you can learn landscape painting this way. Uh, you can even try to do it yourself. You know? um, and indeed, in the art academies, uh, those students who are, like for example, the Central Academy of Fine Arts, who are interested in learning traditional Chinese painting, the, the basic method for uh, pedagogy is copy, the copy reproductions of masters that are sitting there meticulously copying these. Uh, so he did something similar to what he's doing with this project of taking, taking the mechanics of the tradition, but somehow doing it wrong. There's something missing. And what he's playing around with is you have the wen and hua. He's playing around with the hua part as well as the wen part. He's like, I got the wen part and the hua part, this fruitful ambiguity, is this open-endedness part of the tradition. It's part and parcel of the tradition except for the fact that quite often that open-endedness gets shut, shut down. You know, for, and, and, and he experienced that politically, too. It's a kind of political shutting down. So um, this is one of his early famous pieces. I put 1988 to the present because the thing still sh goes around. I mean, for a work of contemporary artists, 1988 is not even contemporary, but somehow it still has its life. Beautiful installation of three different kinds of print matter. Uh, traditional books, uh, this is a reference to Buddhist scroll text, and this is a reference to more modern texts like newspapers mounted on walls in the early period when people in the neighborhood would read them on the wall because mm -hmm. nobody could afford to subscribe to them. Um, also, some suggest the 1979 democracy wall, uh, but when you look at some of these beautiful books, I always wanted one, and I found them in an exhibition for sale, and I thought maybe they were affordable, but they were $10,000 a piece, so I gave up. And then you look at this, and I was, uh, when I saw an installation of this, you know, and you look at the Chinese visitors looking at trying to read the text, because they can't read the text, right? And if you know Chinese, you can't read the text, because these characters don't exist. Right? He spent three to four years and designing and carving out in woodblocks non-existent characters to the tune of some th over 3,000 of them. Um, and one of the things he says, I heard, you know, heard speak and, and talked about this, uh, is, is that he actually enjoyed this. He found the reiteration, this, this repetitiveness. Mm -hmm. um, he says something about this in the Museum of Fire Arts Catalog. The repetitiveness eventually liberating. Um, so, so what is this about? Well, here's some of the text. And it's really playful. I mean, you recognize the forms. If you know Chinese, you can recognize like this. But they don't exist in this combination. 
Or this, you have three persons chasing a mouth. This is, doesn't exist in. So he takes parts of characters, particularly what are called the radicals, mm -hmm. and then he mixes and matches them arbitrarily and for fun. He's got the right idea in many ways and the right patterns, but it, it's missing something. It's missing in a sense, there's a gap between what he's doing and a sense of connection with <coughs> the actual practice of the tradition. Um, and in a sense, it's that gap that's really crucial. Uh, it's the gap that um, is, is the open space for the appropriate responsiveness that brings these things to life, uh, that brings the culture to life. But it's also the gap where creativity happens. Right? So when something new actually happens, even in the traditional of the painting, they don't push it that far. But when, as my teacher would say, giving the tradition a kick in the butt, it's actually playing around the gap and doing something unprecedented. So there's a space for that. Most of the painters were more conservative than that, but there are those who come out, and it's just this great sympathy in the history of European art. And somebody comes out and somehow pushes the boundaries of things, or sees see some great gains and some other, other insight that emerges out of shared practices. And that's what he's interested in, and also highlighting this, this, that gap is really the, the important part, and sometimes missing off, missing in the tradition. That's the source of creativity. It's not nonsense, it's the source of creativity. And then so he, he produces art in that gap. So I'm bringing you something else because, so this Shubink, who's, who's rather self-aware and very, I think, brilliantly, mm -hmm. and also aesthetically, he produces beautiful things. Uh, exploring the tradition, not merely to explore it, because one of the things he, he began to, uh, to do seriously once he left China and ended up in New York was, all right, I, I, I'm not in China anymore. We were talking about this sense of instability and dislocation, and so he felt that. How do you, how do you cross that? How, 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 how do I understand these people? How do I help them understand me? What are the possibilities of communication across really radically different cultures. And so his, a lot of his work since his move to the United States has been focusing on that, exploring the cultural practices of China, but also how they could be transformed so that you engage another audience. Um, so he's been working on There are other artists that continue on in China um, and outside of China who basically follow the brushstroke pattern. And so um, Wu Guangzhou is a master of that. It's not that kind of, uh, say, say cult conceptual creative exploration of basically how you modernize the brush tradition. You know? And so he does the, this is actually a, an image of the rockery in a famous garden in Suzhou, the streets of the lion, woods of the lion grove garden. Um, landscapes, details. But it becomes personal, the modern period of the brush becomes even more intensely personalized. But also incorporating sometimes modern materials and sometimes modern techniques, modern being non-Chinese Western also by him, and um, Mysteria. <coughs> so, yeah. nice, nice comparison to the class. Jackson Pollock and Lunch on the and see what happens. Or this is <laughs> like, Jin is considered one of the so called the new um, scholar artists. Seeing when you're involved. I mean, look at this guy. Look at the doll. You know. um, <laughs> all right, so that. I, th I thought that would be a nice end. Thank you very much.